All right, well, welcome everyone, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules. We know what a busy time of year this is. At the same time, we want to make sure that you get an opportunity to be doing all the different kinds of returns that are available or all the different kinds of business opportunities that are available with Crosslink, and that includes business returns. And so what we're going to cover today, just to make sure that uh, people understand all the different things that will be taking place, we want to just talk about the different types of business returns that are out there, meaning, you know what, how you can expand your business to doing these types of returns when using Crosslink. Then we're going to talk about basic information relating to filing business returns. And then we'll finish up by the simple, consistent approach to completing returns in the Crosslink Business Program. As Justin said, go ahead and type in any questions that you have uh, in the questions bar, and we will make sure that we'll do everything we can to go ahead and answer them at the end of the call. I would like to start with saying, though, that this is not a tax theory class or workshop. Rather, this is literally how to work within the Crosslink program, the business program specifically, and doing business returns. So if the question delves into more of a tax theory type of arena, um, we don't really like to delve into that, but rather focus our attention on how to do things within the Crosslink software. So as we go forward, we're gonna start with types of different business returns that are available with the Crosslink business program. First of all, the first type of return that we're talking about is a sole proprietorship. And sole proprietorship, what's very interesting about that is if you're doing individual returns and people are coming to you with Schedule Cs, meaning they're, they are self-employed, and those types of things, you're already doing a form of a business return. So what's a sole proprietor? First of all, it consists of one owner. And with regard to that, it's unincorporated. We also know that there are no legal liability protections that come with that, meaning that the individual is liable. Schedule Cs, Schedule Fs, and maybe Schedule Es in a very limited capacity. There's what's associated with the sole proprietor within the, the individual program, the 1040. It's taxed as ordinary self-employment income. And finally, of course, it's due on April 15th as part of an individual return. So when we talk about business returns, one of the interesting things is the very first type that's out there is actually one that people are doing whenever they're using the 1040 program and they're helping people who are um, self-employed, one owner, sole proprietors. The next type of business return, which suddenly our program, our business platform can go into is partnerships. And with regard to partnership, what's meant? Two or more partners. These can be individuals, they can be corporations, trusts, estates, and even other partnerships. So a partnership just means multiple entities. The partners have no legal liability protection except when it becomes limited partners. On top of that, income is passed through to each partner, and so it's not taxed at the partnership level, but rather at the individual level. Income is reported to partners on Schedule K-1 and reported on the respective returns and may be subject to self-employment tax. We're going to talk more throughout this session today on K-1s and K and Schedule Ks, and Ben will be here to help give us some additional information on this. On top of that, you use the 1065 unless qualified joint venture, and if that's the case, you can have a married couple. You know it means they could split their Schedule Cs, and however, that must be noted that's not available for LLCs. Finally, the due date is the 15th day of the third month after the tax year and that can be the fiscal or calendar. We'll describe the difference between a fiscal and calendar year just a little bit later. And for a calendar year, that does fall as being March 15th. The next type of business return that's available is a corporation return. These are separate legal entity incorporated by charter from a particular state. On top of that, it is owned by shareholders. Corporations also can be, or excuse me, under that shareholder provision, limited legal liability, it can be public or private, and shareholders may receive distributions, and usually that's in the form of dividends. On top of that, corporate income tax is taxed, and the shareholder distributions are taxed, so if you think about it, there's a double tax that takes place here, one for the corporation, and then of course, the, as the monies are distributed to those folks as well. It's done on a Form 11C, and the due date is the 15th day of the fourth month of the tax year, and that can be either fiscal or calendar year. We also have S corporations. This is very interesting because a lot of times you might have people that were sole proprietors and they decided to incorporate themselves to get some protections. And with regard to that, it generally will follow that they'll become an S corp or S corporation. So what's meant by an S corporation? These are smaller corporations, which means that there'll be fewer than 100 shareholders, only one class of stock. The shareholders are not partnerships or other corporations, and there are no foreign owners that are, that are involved. The other thing about S-corporations is the corporate earnings are not subject to tax at the entity level, 
except on built-in gains or excess net passive income. We also know that income is reported to each shareholder on the Schedule K-1 and reported on the respective returns. This income is not self-employment tax, but S corporations must pay owners a reasonable salary to avoid potential reclassification of any distributions taken by the owner itself. Finally, we know that these are done on the Form 1120S and the due the 15th day of the third month of the tax year, physical or calendar. The next type of business return we want to talk about is limited liability companies. And when we're talking about this, they're formed under state laws. And the owner or owners generally have legal liability protection. And they can be considered disregarded entity. That means Schedule C, E, or F, or a partnership, which we had talked about before as a 1065. An individual is considered to be a sole proprietor unless he or she elects to be taxed as a corporation. And finally, more than one individual is automatically a partnership unless they elect, again, to be taxed as a corporation. Next type of business that we will be talking about is trust. And what's meant by a trust? It's a separate legal entity for federal tax purposes. As part of that, a trust may be created during an individual's life, and there's a term for that, inter vivos, or at the time of his or her death under a will, which is testamentary. A trust or descendants estate figures its gross income in much the exact same manner as it's done on an individual. Now, it's very interesting because, again, this falls under our business package that you can be able to do a trust. But you know what? A lot of the same things take place that you would do on an individual return. Most deductions and credits allowed to individuals are also allowed to the estates and to the trust. A trust or descendant's estate is allowed an income distribution deduction for distributions to the beneficiaries, and that's done on the Schedule B. And finally, this is all done on your Form 1041 and generally must use the calendar year with a due date of April 15th. The last type of business we want to talk about is an estate. With regard to the estate, it begins upon the death of an individual. There's a separate legal entity for it and exists until all assets are distributed. And at that point, then of course, the estate is solved. Any income of greater than $600 from the estate assets must be reported on the Form 1041. So the same 1041 form is used for the estates as, as with trust. And the 1041 is due on the 15th day of the fourth month. Now, now that we've kind of looked at the different kinds of business returns that we can do, let's talk about some very basic filing information. And when we're talking about basic filing information, this is important because it kind of runs across all the different kinds of the returns that you'll be doing. First, we want to talk about accounting periods. And when we talk about accounting periods, the first thing we need to note is that if somebody's talking about a calendar year, that's January to December. And most individuals will follow this type of thing. At the same time, there's also a fiscal count. And with regard to that, or a physical accounting period, I'm sorry, I should say it that correctly, it's a physical accounting period. And these are any continuous 12-month periods other than the calendar year itself. And on top of that, every once in a while, and we won't see this with the small business, we really generally don't see a lot of these, but you do need to understand that there's a difference between the 52-53 week tax year. And what is it that we're talking about here? Well, that's when a particular entity decides to elect to have a tax year end on a certain day of a certain month. So an example, if it's going to end on the third Saturday in October, what will happen is every few years, that'll fall into a situation where it becomes a 53-week tax year. Again, you're not going to see a lot of these, and so this is more for information and only for information. But I can say that if you're talking about accounting periods, it's very important to understand calendar, fiscal, and then every once in a while you may hear 52 slash 53 week tax year. Next up, we want to talk about accounting methods. When we're talking about accounting methods, the first thing we note is just there's cash. And of course, that's most individuals encounter when constructively received or paid. You also have accrual, and in accrual situations, the income is included when all events occur that fix the right to receive the income. And of course, this will be the earliest of performance taking place payment is due or receiving a payment. And then finally, there's a hybrid, which has an element of both. Ben, you and I were talking about this just a little bit earlier today. Can you give uh, kind of general examples of the difference between cash and accrual? Who will be using cash? Who will be using accrual? 
most small businesses tend to use uh, cash accounting just as a general rule because it, a lot of time is simpler. Basically, as money comes in, it's income. As you make a payment, it's an expense. It is possible for small businesses to use accrual. Uh, and then any business that is following generally accepted accounting principles is going to be on a accrual basis as well. In that one, think about when you send a bill for work, you're going to be able to include that expected revenue as your income in the current year because you have the right to receive it, whether you actually receive it in the current year or not. Hopefully that clarifies the usage. As you said, the hybrid could have elements of both. Um, you don't see a whole lot of those specifically outlined. Most people tend to choose one or the other. Perfect, thank you so much, Ben. So again, smaller businesses that you'll be working with tend to gravitate towards cash. Uh, people that are using generally accepted accounting principles will probably be using an accrual formula, okay? Very good, thank you, sir. Continuing on, what we wanna talk about is an income statement. And this is important because people will bring you your income statements and, and these are what you're going to be completing when doing the return itself. So what's made up of an income statement? It's really quite straightforward. It means it's your gross income minus any returns. That will equate to your net sales. Top of that, you have to take into consideration the cost of goods sold. Then you'll get to your gross profit. Finally, you also might need to take away the expenses associated with the business, and from there, you get your net income. So what will happen is literally, when people are looking at this type of thing, this is what they're gonna be providing for you. Here is a real life example. You'll see your gross sales on top, your net sales, your cost of goods sold, so on and so forth, until you get to the net income that's found at the bottom, okay? Continuing on, we can talk about balance sheets next. And balance sheets follows the basic accounting formula that is as follows. First of all, assets equate to liabilities plus owner's equity. So what do we mean by that? Let's give a real, a real couple of real life examples. First of all, Brenda puts down $10,000 and finances the rest. That's $40,000 to start the yoga studio. Fair enough. What does that mean? Her assets equate to being $50,000. And what do we talk about? Well, $40,000 is the liability. That means the money that you borrow plus the equity, her equity, excuse me, and that would be $10,000. In example two, Jeff buys a van with no financing for his delivery service. In that particular instance, guess what? The assets are 18,000, the money that he paid. There are no liabilities, and that means the owner's equity would be $18,000. Here's a real life example of a balance sheet that somebody might bring you. And again, this is very simply taking your assets minus your liabilities, or, and your liabilities. It also includes, of course, your equity. Continuing on, we want to talk about inventory for just a moment. When speaking of inventory, an inventory is necessary to clearly show income when the production, purchase, and or sale of merchandise are income-producing factors. So what is that we're talking about? There are three popular methods of inventory. First of all, specific identification. Then you'll hear a lot of first in, first out inventory, and last in, first out inventory. So some examples of things that belong in inventory, that would include the merchandise, goods under contract, goods held for display rooms, raw materials, work in progress, finished products, as well as supplies. All of those are what make up, and they're just examples of some of, if not most of the situations that would constitute uh, inventory for a particular business. Continuing on, we need to talk about cost of goods sold. So when doing business returns, this is another um, very important thing that you need to understand. These are the expenses directly related to the sale of bought or produced goods. And what do we mean by that? Important in determining the inventory, and it includes things like raw materials, inventory purchases, freight of shipping goods, and salaries associated with production. So when we were talking about inventory before, one of the things we have to use is cost of goods sold as part of determining inventory. Now that we kind of have the basics, we talked about what kinds of things, or what kind of business returns can now be done by utilizing our product, that being a cross-linked business platform. And then we wanted to talk about some accounting or, or, or uh, tax preparation basics. The next piece that we really want to delve into is using cross the cross-linked business program. And so when we're talking about the cross-linked business program itself, some things to note. 
first of all, when working within the 1065 partnership type of return. And we can toggle into the program here in just a moment and show the different kinds, but let's talk about what would be included or the areas you'd be responsible for completing when doing a particular kind of return. In the 1065 program, the partnership one, first of all, there would be the client data, that's general information, but then you'd be responsible for the Schedule B. And these are ownership questions. One of the interesting things about using the business program, is we will talk about this a little bit further down the road, is, is that there is not um, an interview mode, if you will. Well, there doesn't need to be an interview mode because the Schedule B will ask ownership related questions, which will, when answered will help complete the return itself. So you're doing a Schedule B, on top of that, there'll be the Schedule K and Schedule K1. And with regard to that, I'm gonna turn this one over to Ben for just a moment to make sure that everyone understands the difference between these two important schedules. Ben? Sure, okay. Um, one thing to think about is the relationship here of a business return compared to an individual return. On an individual return, you have obviously a Schedule C with business income and expenses we talked about earlier. Some of you are familiar with that. But on the front of the 1040, you also have other kinds of income, interest, dividends, rental, whatever. On the Schedule K, that is serving a similar function. You're taking your business income from the front page of the 1065, and you're reporting it here along with all the other types of income that the business might receive, interest, dividends, and so on and so forth, along with expenses, credits, and general other information. The Schedule K will show the total of all of those amounts. On the Schedule K-1, each partner will re uh, receive a report of their individual share based on what is called their distributive share percentages. And those can be allocated based on profit, loss, or special allocation by each partner. Excellent, thank you, Ben. So again, we have to remember, and this will come up again in some of the other types of returns, but Schedule K and Schedule K-1 are different, but they both need to be completed. You also have the Schedule L, which is the balance sheet, which is assets, liabilities, and equity. And then we want to talk about Schedule M-1. We will also have, of course, Schedule M-2, but I'm going to call on Ben again because this is such an important piece because we get so many questions every year about what it is that the Schedule M-1 does. Ben? So, if you were to look at the M-1, the core concept that you need to understand is that tax returns show both book income and tax income. And what we mean by that is when you have book income, that is the net income, so the revenue minus expenses, that you're showing on your books. This is what you might report to a bank if you're looking for a loan. Uh, it could be the, what you're reporting to shareholders if you're publicly owned. But as a tax return, you might have different income because you're entitled to certain things under tax law that you might not be using for purposes of completing your uh, books and records. So the Schedule M1 just reconciles that book income to what you're going to report as taxable income. That's outstanding. So in a nutshell, well put, Ben, the difference or what the, re the purpose of the M1 is certainly you may have records that indicate what you did as a particular business, in this particular case, a partnership, but because there might be additional things that you have on your side of the ledger, if you will, when doing the return, some credits, whatever it might be, guess what? That reconciliation is done on the Schedule 1. And of course, there's Schedule M2, which tracks partner capital accounts and distributions as well. When working in the 1120 corporation return, there's some other things that you're going to be responsible for. We talked about the general information. There's general information on all of these, but you know what? It's, it's, very, it's very similar to what you would see as the client data when doing an individual return. So this would be the name, the EIN, the tax year, the date incorporated, et cetera. That's general information that would be completed on the 1124. On top of that, you'd have income, which are gross receipts, cost of goods sold, as well as other income. There would also be deductions for officer and employee compensation, as well as operating expense. And finally, another piece that you would have, and we're going to go into more things on the 1120, 
is taxes, and that would include income, tax calculation, as well as credits. Other things that you'll be responsible for on the 1120 will include the Schedule C, which is dividends received by the corporation from another entity, your Schedule J, which is tax computation and credits, the Schedule K, which will have the business codes, accounting method, as well as ownership. Continuing on, you'll have the Schedule L, which will be the balance sheet, the Schedule M1, which is again the reconciliation we were talking about before, as well as the Schedule M2, which is the analysis of retained earnings. Ben, anything you want to talk about with regard to the M2 here? Generally, the M2 is another reconciliation concept. Uh, it is tracking the status of income that your business has received over the years, over time. And it just accounts for um, you know, the income that you get to keep minus the distributions that you send out to the owners and that is how it reconciles and it uh, works together with the balance sheet on the schedule l to create a balanced book excellent thank you sir so those are some things that you will be responsible for when completing the 1120 corporate return or corporation return Next, we want to talk about the 1120S Corporation Return and some of the things that are required when completing that. You start with, again, the general information. The parallel in the individual world would be your client data, but this will include your name, EIN, tax year, so, so on and so forth. On top of that, you'll need to be able to capture income, and these will be your gross receipts and costs of goods sold, as well as other income. And then deductions, this will be officer and employee compensation, as well as operating expenses, and of course, taxes or other taxes, only tax on built-in gains and or excess and not passive income. Continuing on the 1120 corporation return, oh, excuse me, 1120S, I'm sorry, the small one. Schedule B, this will be the business code accounting method as well as ownership. The Schedule K and K1, which we talked about a little bit earlier, but the same principles apply. Ben, anything that's specific in the 1120S, or is it very similar to what we were talking about in the partnership world? So they are very similar. Uh, the concept that I described earlier applies for the S Corp as well. The key difference that you'd want to be aware of here is that a partnership offers flexibility because each owner's share of distribution can be based on how the partners agree to split things up. In an S Corporation environment, though, all distributions are done based on the owner's percentage of ownership, whether that's stock or uh, however, as, however else the ownership is determined. But it's much more rigid for an S corporation than it is for a partnership. Excellent point. So even though you're filling out the same type of form, please remember there are guidelines associated with doing S corps or corporation returns as opposed to some of the flexibility that's associated with partnerships. Thank you, Ben. Next up, we'll talk about the, the, the included in the things that you'll need to complete will be the Schedule L, which is the balance sheet, assets, liabilities, and equity, as well as the Schedule M1. We've talked about the reconciliation before, and of course, it'll still hold true here, and that will include your Schedule M1 as well as M2. Now, when using Crosslink Business, when you're talking about estates and trusts, these are your 1041 returns. The things that you'll be responsible for completing will again start with your general information as well as income and this will be the various types as they are totaled deductions this will include things like taxes fees as well as charitable uh, contributions or deductions or charitable deductions and then taxes and payments this is taxable income calculated tax as well as previous payments continuing on we need to remember that also a schedule a which determines deductions for charitable contributions. Schedule B, which determines the uh, determination of the deduction for distributions of income made to the beneficiaries. And the Schedule G, what is the tax computation as well as credits. And finally, there's even miscellaneous things that you'll wanna make sure you're looking at as, as well when doing, excuse me, estate and trust. Now, one of the things we want to bring this all back to is just using the program itself. We've started about the we started with the kind of collecting the different kinds of returns that you'll now be able to do, and from that we wanted to give some basic accounting information or tax preparation information 
as it is relevant to the world of completing business returns. We talked about specific things that needed to be filled out in every single one of these types of returns, whether it be a partnership, a corporation, S Corp, or an estate and trust. The last thing we want to talk about, and the most important thing, is how easy it is to do these things within the Crosslink program. And one of the things we start with is the Crosslink business uses the exact same methodology as the Crosslink 1040 program. It's fascinating to see one of the things that our developers were able to do is really make it look and feel very similar. And so those types of things like the business return summary, which is your landing page, is exactly the same as what we call the work and path progress summary page that you would find on an individual return. It's your landing page and kind of gives you the state of the different things that are going with your business returns at any given time. On top of that, you'll have your attached forms, and your attached forms will include things like your client data, the financial statements, your document archive, all the forms that have been added, you as the tax professional added to that, and the refund amount or the re amount that's owing. Just like on an individual return, your attached forms is going to capture all the things that have been added to this particular return, and based on the data that's been entered, whether or not there is money coming back or there is money that is owing. On top of that, you can also actual, uh, excuse me, access the actual form itself, whether it be a 1065, a 1041, from the attached forms. That is no different than if you were in our regular program and you wanted to click on the 1040 and go straight down the form itself. You can go down straight down the 1065, the 1041, whatever it might be, by clicking on the form itself, and of course that will just take you down from top to bottom. Continuing on. It will have the same active window. When we talk about it as far as the active window, if you don't know, you can look below. And that will include things like choices, worksheets, and form links. So the same exact things that you would have in our individual program, the 1040, you have here, where you'll see highlighted choices, worksheets, or form links if there's associated forms to the field that you are in, in the program itself. Most important of these things is the descriptor that's always found down at the bottom. If you happen to find yourself in a field that's look, and you're looking for some information, you can find exactly what's being looked for by simply looking at the active window, which is that bottom, and it will tell you what is required in the particular field you're working in. It is a forms-based program, meaning there is no return interview mode. As we talked about a little bit earlier in this broadcast, one of the things is that Schedule B in many instances asks the same types of questions that you might be asking as an interview mode within the individual program, 1040. So it is a form space, which still, as the tax professional, you always prefer. So one of the things we like to say is the difference between an interview mode by itself and a form space is you control the software in the form space. You choose to add the forms as you want to, as opposed to an interview approach which you know what makes the software kind of control you. So this is great. When you're doing business returns, you will decide on the forms that you're going to add in order to complete the particular business return. It is a forms-based approach. Financial data importing is available. And what do we talk about with regard to that? We're talking about not only zero, but also we're talking about um, from accounting uh, software that's out there that you can, you can go ahead and you can use that type of thing. Most common that we oftentimes hear about is QuickBooks and that, that financial importing, data importing is available in the program. And in fact, in just a moment, we'll show you exactly how you can get that. Also paperless office features and text messaging are also integrated into the program itself. All the exact same types of features that you see in the individual program are available here as well. So let's go ahead and toggle into the program here for just a moment. And when we do so, the, one of the things that you're going to see right away is that we have the attached forms list over here. In this particular case, at 1124, form is being done. That's the corporate return itself. And I said that you could actually go down the form itself by simply clicking on here. Again, as you were to add, if, if you were to add different forms and add data, what would happen is it would then put you into a position where you could you could either find out right away whether there's money that's owing or if there's money that's coming back to the particular business entity that we're talking about here. Now, this is just a brand new one. I just wanted to show the active window that's found at the bottom. It's the exact same that you're gonna find on the individual return, which means that it will tell you exactly what's required regardless of what field you're in. And of course, choices, worksheets, and form links are available here as well. Same types of principles, same types of methodology that you find in our individual program. What I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to close this particular, since I was just starting up a new return, one of the things I can do is I'd like to kind of go to an existing one in which we kind of built, if you will. Let's see, we'll do another 1120. 
And you can see, here's your attached forms list on the left-hand side. Here are the different forms that have been added. Here's the amount that's being owed either at the state level or as well at the corporate level. All the things are exactly the same. You notice the client data, which it mirrors the same types of things that you're looking for as far as the client data that's associated with an individual return. Information and status is very similar. But then after that, these important ones are your financial. Here's where you're going to complete your income statement, and here's where you're going to complete your balance sheet. So income statements, one of the things is that you're going to take the income statements that come and you're going to complete the information. And by the way, if you've ever done a Schedule C in our individual software, individual return software, the 1040 software, you'll notice it's very similar. You have your revenue and then you have your expenses, the exact same things that you're reporting on the Schedule C. You'd be doing the exact same thing here in the business program under income statements. So toggling back into the program, next up we want to kind of talk about a couple of very specific things or idiosyncrasies associated with doing returns in our software. First of all, if you choose transcript mode in the client data, the return will have to be paper filed. If I toggle back into the program just for just a moment, you'll see right away that I go to the client data. You can go into a transcript mode up here, but if you check this, it's not going to be eligible for electronic filing. On top of that, for returns with depreciation, you can check the box at the top of the financials income statement or even the financials balance sheet in either instance to have process calculate the applicable lines from the asset manager. That's a choice that you would make as the tax professional if you'd like to do that. Other things to remember for 1065 and 1120S returns, be sure to include contributions and distributions on the owner's basis worksheet. Very important to note that you open the worksheets from the complete basis worksheet for this shareholder partner question on the owner's K-1. And I know that we get a lot of issues with regard to this type of thing, so I'm going to ask Ben to weigh in or just give us a little bit more color on this particular issue and the importance of making sure that you do these, this one correctly. Ben? Right. So the basis worksheet is important because it, it tracks each owner's interest in this business over time. Um, and with on the, or within that basis worksheet, you'll also find that there are things for entering items that are specific to each owner, meaning that they're not necessarily based on their ownership interest. A great example would be a partnership where the partners can take unequal distributions or might contribute things uh, separately. It doesn't necessarily have to be based on a uh, on their respective ownerships by having these fields on the basis worksheet that are unique to each owner you can accurately track their interest over time thank you sir let's finish up uh, as far as some special considerations when using the software a couple more real quick first of all for rentals reported on 8825 on either the 1065 or the 1120s returns Either enter the income and expenses from Form 8825 and check the box at the top, or enter the income and expenses on the income statement, and that would be find out, found on lines 8, H, and 37 with the applicable code. So important to note that a common issue is entering the 8825 and not checking the box. Ben, didn't you tell me that this is one of the most common things that we see out there? It is, and the, the reason it's so important to do it properly, so you can enter it directly on the 8825 if that's how you're used to doing it on your Schedule E rentals. That's okay, but you need to make sure you check that box so that we properly reconcile the M1 that we talked about earlier. Nice. Very good. Finally, when working on income statements and business returns, when assessing the correlating worksheet for state income tax expenses, and that's found on line 32B, make sure to pick the correct metro entity. That's so important. Ben, as we built this out and I've built the program across the country for the different areas, a lot of different metros have different uh, considerations. So it's important to do that, correct? That's right. Uh, and as you fill out the income statement and when you're filling out the tax expense worksheet, Generally speaking, those taxes that you paid are going to be deductible at the federal level, but you want them to flow to the correct place in the rest of the return for the states and municipalities. So we provide a list of state and municipality codes for you to direct it to the right destination. And an example of that is the New York City Metro, 
uh, Portland Metro, Philadelphia, things like that. And it is important to scroll down and find the correct code so that it flows where it belongs in the return. <laughs> And you folks do a lot of hard work making sure that's up to date, correct? I mean, that's amazing, the different metro areas and the different uh, considerations each one has. So thank you for doing that for us. Let's go ahead and finish up by talking about some updates to Crosslink Business. And when we're talking about updates, that will come out with the next year's program. Now, we have launched the individual, the 1040 program, and we did so about a week ago. Our business program will launch in about a month or so. We wanted to give you some heads up as to some coming attractions, if you will, or things that will be found in the new program. Again, if you were to go in and look at your business program today, these won't be there, but they will be when the new program comes out in late December, beginning of January. So for the business side, there'll be new extended reports, and this will include new search and display fields have been added to the extended reports, making it easier to create custom reports. On top of that, we will now also display the forms that the information is being pulled from, that can include officers, SSN, the account number, as well as the routing number. Also, there'll be new and updated business forms that will come with the software. The following form and updates have been made to the business software. Again, when the new program comes out, it'll include the 1120C form has been added to the 1120 corporate package. So the form 1120C has been added to the 1120 corporate package or will be. And then the client organizer, this is really important. I'm going to ask Ben to give us just a little bit more insight on this one. And that is, is that each business entity type will have a client organizer to help tax preparers gather tax data from their clients. Ben, if you can go just kind of weigh in on how this will look and feel. Uh, ultimately, it should be kind of similar to the organizer you're already used to in the 1040. It, it's slightly different. Uh, it, the idea is that it follows the client data screen to begin with and then generally has something akin to the income statement and balance sheet that you're going to send to the clients and ask them to fill it out because nobody wants to deal with a shoebox full of receipts. So it gives you an opportunity at least to kind of put that onus for front end work on your clients up front if you can. And it, it, it's a new opportunity for us to kind of make your life a little bit easier, hopefully. That's the term organizer. Very well put. I, I'm, I'm excited to see it myself. Well, good. All right, there's one last thing. Oh, I'm sorry, there's some business state updates that we need to provide as well. The program now has the capability of complete returns for these business states. That means the 1120, 1120S, and 1065. We've added states, and here's a list of them here. I won't rattle them off, but you can just take a moment to see what's been added to the program or will be added to the program when we launch the 2024 edition. Now, one last and very important update. I'm really going to ask Ben to kind of take us through this one because it's really interesting, and we have added something to the program or will be adding to it, which will help people in this regard, and that has to do with new reporting requirements. For corporations, LLCs, and limited partnerships, please note that the, under the Corporate Transparency Act, which was enacted in 2021, all corporations, LLCs, and limited partnerships are required to file a beneficial ownership report with the Financial Crimes and Enforcement Network, and that began on 1-1 of 2024. So that's right around the corner. It applies to all corporations, LLCs, limited partnerships, and, and any entity created by filing a document with a state, and companies that are already in existence on the 1st will have until the beginning of next year, 2025, to file their initial report. However, if it's newly incorporated or if it's a brand new LLC, they will have 30 days to which to create that registered, uh, excuse me, after they've been registered, they have 30 days to do this. And Ben, this is a very important one, and you were talking to me about this before the call, and I'd love to hear your, your uh, perspective on this and its importance. Okay, so as Steve mentioned, this is uh, it's a new regulatory thing. If you in the past have been dealing with that question on the Schedule B relating to uh, foreign bank account ownership, then you're probably somewhat already familiar with the fine send process. Well, this is kind of similar, um, except it applies to pretty much everybody that's a, uh, a small business that meets the requirements. What we have done is, well, first be aware, as of the time of recording this webinar, there is no third party integration. So your software company can't file this for you. But what we have done is provided a link within the software 
to get you to the small business compliance guide, which is written in plain English and helps you understand whether or not your client has a filing responsibility. And then you can help them uh, meet that responsibility if, if it's appropriate. Uh, there are a couple of useful items within that compliance guide that uh, I would encourage you to look at, but there are things that include exceptions to filing. One example is tax exempt entities. Uh, you know, a 501c3 can be a corporation, which as you look at here, would generally be subject to the filing requirement, but there's an exception for tax exempt entities. So those filers, even though they're a corporation, they don't have to file this beneficial ownership information report. So that is uh, available in the soft software uh, with our first release. And I do encourage you to take a little bit of time and at least read through it and get familiar with the exemptions to help your clients know whether or not they have a filing obligation. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ben. This is very important. Obviously, this is on the horizon and really begins to take effect at the beginning of the year. So with that, what we've run, we've reached the end of our presentation.